just to come into this session, uh, my name is Razvan, um, or if you want, you can call me Raz for short. Uh, I am one of the multiple technical leads uh, within the AI, IoT, and machine learning um, group in Microsoft. Um, just to tell you a bit of what we're, what we're doing, uh, we are taking uh, developer requests from uh, the different customers that are using our technologies. Um, there's no secret here. I can say things like uh, you, you might have UiPath, you might have um, different banks that are using um, these kind of technologies to, to work with us. So um, it puts me in a good uh, position to be able to talk about one of what is currently in the US, and I think it's on the whole of uh, EMEA as well, one of the most controversial technologies, um, because facial recognition comes with a lot of uh, personal attributes, uh, and it creates um, an issue on uh, ethical, uh, per, from an ethical perspective, which we're going to uh, tackle later on. Um, just to make you aware, this presentation isn't going to be about our technologies. This presentation is going to be about the technology um, as approach from uh, different um, companies. And um, I think it would help at least to understand what's in the back of that and how to make it um, so that different people can consume it whenever they want. Um, that's me. I don't know if um, if the students want to do a quick turn. Uh, yeah, sir. And Kelly, can you hear us? Uh, yes, sir. We cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can you please, guys, uh, give us a cue if you can hear us? Yeah, sir, yeah. Kelly. Okay. Uh, Kelly, I think we've heard you. Uh, for yes, sir, I just want to do a quick. Can you the, know? Yes, we can. Okay. You found it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There we go. yeah uh, my name is Yasser. I'm 18. I uh, I want to be a dentist. Personally. <laughs> But I also enjoy this subject quite a lot because uh, from childhood I play a lot of video games, so I have some sort of idea with technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's how most of Thank us. Thank you, Yasser. Uh, Kelly. Um. Oh, you can call me Kelly, and I'm also 18. And for facial recognition, I'm. Well, I'm quite interested in these topics. Uh, Kelly is an artist, by the way. I think that's uh, where she will pursue a career. She's got great drawings. Ah, nice. Well, we're, we're going to touch a bit on uh, comparing art and comparing people. <laughs> that's, that's another issue. <laughs> yeah. So you might, might find this uh, interesting. OK, uh, let me then go through this. We're not, I know we're tight on uh, on the time. Um, I just wanted to say really quick that uh, face recognition is actually a subdomain of computer vision. Uh, what computer, or computer vision um, or object detection? I would say object detection uh, based on uh, computer vision. Um, because what you can do is you can take an image and you can try to uh, identify different objects and we will see how later on. Um, the point is your focus uh, for facial recognition is to ensure that the mathematical concept detects those features. Uh, another subcategory would be, and this is one actually one of the first subcategories was uh, optical character recognition. It uh, was actually started in the 1980s, if it's um, uh, as a small fun fact, and it was done for the postal office in the US. Now, this is one of the easiest object recognition um, uh, approaches, uh, especially if this is writing with one color on a um, complement uh, background, right? Because you don't have uh, many things to to filter out. You don't have noise to filter out. That's something you just take on uh, find the pixels that represent the letters that um, are of the less dominant uh, color. But facial recognition, that's a bit more difficult. And I'm giving here an example of a person um, that was detected um, as an object 
effect uh, within that uh, that image. And the reason this is a bit more difficult is because you have certain features there. You have a lot of background. Um, you you have a lot of noise if you want for for this operation that could result in misclassification. Now, that being said, how do you get from um, an image? Uh, how do you pass that through object detection? Right, and then how do you determine that the object you want or you detect is a face? So, what you want to to start off with is it's a model. Uh, you want to determine a model that doesn't detect what the face is, doesn't detect what um, who who that person is. It detects where inside that image you have this object representation, and then you you start from there. Uh, I'm going to pause here for a second because I can see Yasser has his hands raised. Yeah, on the previous slide, can you go back a moment? Yeah. So on this image, it shows the weight, height, left, top. Is this uh, information you have to input or is this automatically put by itself? This is a good question and this is really good that it comes after what I just said. So. From, from the first step that I've defined, I'm saying create a model that can determine where a face is located. It doesn't detect um, who that person is, it detects where a face is located. So this part here that you've described, you've asked about, this is what that classifier has identified to be the bounding area where to focus your uh, further processing. Oh, okay. Right, so that was detected by one of the algorithms that you can use because it's identified from a, the whole image, which can be many pixels by many pixels. It says start from 0 0.193 by 193 and go 326 to the left um, and then go 204 down. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And all the others, I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. All the other attributes, mm -hmm. those you would you would look for with more with more powerful mo models, but only once you've identified the area you need to look into, because um, as and we'll see that in a, in a short bit, the, the the model what it's going to do is it's going to remove the noise and focus uh, the Further, uh, further models that are coming after it uh, within a smaller and even smaller area. So as I said, you, you have this model through which you detect where a face is located in an image. You then process those into, you, you, you need to process those images further on into a model that's uh, into a format that's accepted by your model, right? Um, and once you have this process of adding images continuously to, to your model, um, you can then determine certain uh, attributes for that face. You can use, you can determine where the eyes are, you can determine where the mouth is, you can um, look at uh, is that person smiling or is that uh, person um, frowning or, or these other um, I want to say feelings, but I'm not sure. Emotions, perhaps that's the that's better that word. And then from there you can expand. I mean, once you have defined uh, this approach, narrow your area of search. Um, make sure um, that your image represents the correct um, visualization. Then you can extract or you, you apply pattern matching to that to detect those features. Um, and we'll see exactly how. Then once you have that, you can expand to whatever principles you want. It can be identification, it can be uh, to, to verify between uh, two, two similar faces or to determine uh, the distance in similarity uh, and so on. So this stands at the basis of uh, most of the technologies that you would see. Um, how do you actually determine where a face is in an image, right? That's one of the, the most complicated aspects, but you can differentiate between, um, uh, use different algorithms that find your facial regions and non-facial re regions. Uh, this would be mostly machine learned, um, and it, it would 
try to, we'll see in the next image, it would try to overlap on the, that image, a set of pixels that would match closely to some of the facial features, as I said earlier, nose, face, and they would keep, um, keep doing that across the matrix of pixels until it defines an area uh, that no long that supports that or an area that no longer supports that so to to remove that um yeah uh, th that was actually the part i was talking about um another one is you know you have this set of rules right you know you you need to have your eyes you have your nose you have your mouth so it's through this process of overlapping the pixels or it's uh in other algorithms, it's through a process of um, overlapping templates. And we'll see in a second what that is. A template is a matrix of data points. Um, and the closer, the closer the face in the image is to that template, it would recognize that it, that is a face or not. But that ha it's not as good as the process itself. Um, of using machine uh, learned approach because it can overlap with cartoons. It can overlap with. I've seen. I've actually had um, uh, a request where the customer was complaining. Why is it detecting a face made out of leaves? Because in the end, the face is a face, right? It has these features. It's, it's, there's a bit of similarity, right? You might arrange those leaves in a in a particular manner. But um, enough. Um, let, let's let's go into some of that uh, to visualize some of that. So as I was saying, what it's doing is it would overlap. Uh, this is one of the most commonly used approaches. It would overlap um, those pixels to uh, on those areas of the image to see if it uh, matches those particular features. So in the first image here, in, in the first figure, you can see that the eyebrow was or the nose or the mouth was changed to these predetermined um, features. Um, they're called HAR features. Um, and if you want to read more, it you can see the process of that algorithm. It, I've put it in the references. Um, the mathematics behind that is so um, commonly used that you don't have to do it from scratch now. You can import it as a library in most of the most known um, visual uh, libraries. I'm talking here about OpenCV. Um, perhaps you have used, uh, have heard of TensorFlow. Perhaps you have heard of uh, of Keras. Um, if you haven't, um, those are the last two are some of the very uh, they're they're very specific within the data science realm. Um, for Keras, there's actually a challenge. So for who's interested in a, in a mathematical and programming challenge, um, it, it, in, a, in, in the scope of um, getting yourself more known in the data science world. But I'm, I'm talking here about setting those, uh, those um, HAR-like features on top of an image. Um, I'm, but that's one approach to object detection. It might not be the only approach to, to object detection. So how do I distinguish between a face? How do I distinguish between a building? How do I distinguish between um, a car? What I do is I use something that's called a cascade classifier. Now, that, that this is an approach through which I pass an image through a mathematical classifier and the closer is uh, if it passes that classification uh, it would go to a more complex classifier and a more complex classifier and a more complex classifier so what it needs to do through this cascade classifier it needs to um, complete this chain of classif classifications until it is proven that that is the object that you are looking for so I can, and these are publicly available, I can take a template, um, I, um, not a template because template is a key term that we're going to use later on. I can take a definition for these classifiers that um, it's a definition, a mathematical definition for the different objects. I can take a mathematical definition for what faces look like, right, from a pre-built uh, mathematical model. I load that with my cascade classifier, and then I pass my image through through this uh, through this system. If I don't 
um, match that if I don't get to the end of that classifier, then most likely the region that the algorithm has been looking at does not depict a face. So what am I going to do next? I'm going to expand the region and, and or going to move that um, through uh, through the image. Uh, uh, Razvan, can I ask a question here? Like, you can. You, you said about uh, classifiers. Are those like hard coded uh, into the algorithm or they are just a part of the machine learning process? Because um, I, I believe like it's the algorithm should be able to distinguish between a human face and the monkey face because they have uh, same facial features like eyes and nose and mouth for the uh, for the face recognition to be able to say it's a human face or a monkey face human face should have should have some limitations between like the length of nose uh, like the distance between the eyes so but there are always exceptions to those cases so when it's able, is it able to improve it on its own, like through machine learning or those classifiers in your case? And I'm not sure in Microsoft uh, approach, it, it, are those uh, hard coded? So uh, this, this, this it, it, it's not specific to, to Microsoft. This is a general approach to doing facial detection. And you're right there. So those classifiers might have a weakness in determining if a face is from a human, if determining if a face is from, uh, like you said, a, a, a monkey. It might have an issue determining if that face is from Shrek or not. Mm -hmm. um, the, the domain in which you apply these classifiers, um, especially in the context of object dete detection, as I said, in my first, in, in our first approach, when we're looking at an image, we need to see in which area we have a face. Then we expand on that. Do we see a face of a, um, of a known uh, cartoon uh, character? Do we see the face of, a, um, of something that's not, not human, but it's humanoid? Um, because I can detect a face, and I can I can uh, detect a face from cartoon characters. If I draw a cartoon character, uh, or if I uh, draw a character from a game, a face is a face. And it's again coming to what I said earlier with the leaves issue, right? There was an issue there with those leaves. Um, so that is the general approach. Now, what comes after that? Yes, it is. A w there are ways to improve on that. Um, on that model, you can use machine a machine learning approach where um, the first approach would be to you for you to classify uh, those images to label those Im images as coming from cartoon characters as coming from from humans uh, or coming from non humans and to uh, permit the model to learn the difference in in those uh, images in those templates and um, We'll see what the template is in a second. But I think as a starting point, what we're interested in is to see if there is a face in a particular area. Then we want to see what we can do with that face. Um, and then we want to see if we should be using that face or not. All right. Um, coming back again to updating the models. Now, this is an approach that was established in the early 2000s. Um, since then, that approach has evolved in many different ways. Um, obviously, the research behind that has made more and more accurate models. And by accuracy, what I mean by accuracy, uh, I'm not saying that um, it would be able to better detect, not just say that it would be able to better detect faces in a more noisy image, Right, I have an image with uh, varying colors. I might have an image with gradients from left to right, um, but um, I'm also able to uh, detect from those images if here I'm talking about um, the different uh, colors that are used, the, perhaps uh, the, the different qualities that are used there. So those mathematical models have evolved since then. Uh, and there's no one stopping the next generation of um, data scientists to find an even better approach to, to detecting faces. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir, do you have a question? Not at the moment, no. Okay. Um, so why I'm still uh, at this part here is because, as I said, the approach that was used here was 
uh, and I'm just going to read from here because it's an actual extract of the paper that I've talked about that was published in the early 2000s, is that the first way is that the, this model works is to detect the area where this is uh, where a face is located, right? Um, then you have a learning algorithm which selects a number of critical visual features um, from a larger set and then generates even more efficient classifiers, right? So as I said, I have a one classifier that's going to go through the image and try to detect certain features. If it passes that, I'm going to send that to the even more complex classifier. Mm -hmm. uh, if it passes that, and then even to the more complex, until after completing that, I will uh, be able to discard uh, region, quickly discard regions in the image that don't represent a face, and then just focus on the uh, region that represents a face. After that, um, and obviously I can change that classifier. That's the beauty of this approach. I can change that classifier so that it doesn't just look at faces. It can look at any kind of other objects. Once I have a face, um, what I'm going to do with that, I am going to create something which is called a template, right? I've been using this word and I've been um, omitting this word for a while now, but what a template is, and let me again read from its definition. It, a template is a, uh, it's a vector of those features, but it's not the image itself. Uh, I think the simplest representation is the one you've seen in, uh, in a lot of the, in a lot of movies and a lot of shows, and you can actually see this in the image here. It, it's these data points you have, right? So these data points, they they after you've determined um, where your eyebrows are located, where your mouth, where the mouth is located, the edge of the face, because I'm using that as well as a feature. I'm going to try to generate some facial data because I'm going to use those data points that template uh, for, for matching at, at uh, or comparison at some point. Yes, go ahead. Uh, people have all sorts of different shapes of faces and different eyes and different lips, eyebrows. How do you use a, the same template or do you just have many templates? So, um, in this context here, the template in, we need to understand that the template here is different from a, uh, a template that you would use to uh, create other faces out of. A template here is essentially a, a mathematical representation of your face. And I'm going to use that template of your face because it's not going to be your actual face, it's going to be an uh, approximate representation of your face. And I'm going to use that, that face further on uh, to, to match it against pictures of yourself, or I'm going to match it against uh, pe uh, other people's faces. So in, in, this, in this context here, um, I am going to start assuming all the features are there and we'll see in uh, towards a responsible AI what happens when the all the features aren't there. But I'm going to start with assuming that all the features are there so I can start having an accurate model. Then if I, those features change in time, right, uh, I can retrain the system to, to determine or to understand how those changes still reflect to the same template of, oh, sorry, to the same person. Because mm -hmm. I can have multiple templates of a person's face associated with the same person. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to calculate the distance between those data points in, in between templates. And I'm going to generate uh, a mathematical uh, representation of that. And that's what I'm going to use to compare against other people's templates. Okay. Does that does that yeah. make uh, make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Because yeah, the, the, the the word template is confusing, so it's rather <laughs> people consider it's template. It's I think it's a uh, the foundation for all faces, but as you said here, it's specific to one person here. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. And, and that's that's important to distinguish because. Um, some and I've seen some applications. They they might have an overlay uh, of where you need to 
uh, put your face so that it it, it has a, a great um, has better accuracy. So perhaps you start your application, you can see a, a, a resemblance of a human face, and you know that uh, you need to match so that your face fills in that area, right? That is not a template of a face. That is just a representation of a face. Uh, of a face, because I'm not going to um, start on that and then um, determine that every person has that same template. No, uh, the template in facial recognition is a mathematical representation of a single person, and then how that mathematical representation of that single person changes over time. Also. Um, as we're going to touch on responsible, a responsible AI later on, a t a, the template a, doesn't allow you to reconstruct the image. A, there's not there's not enough data for you to take a template and recreate the original image, but there is enough data in that template to understand if this is coming from the same person or if it's coming from different people. If we're also at uh, at this step. Um, just want to come back to our representation here and say that for any system, and by system here I mean any architecture that uh, refers to um, a, a services of uh, facial recognition, or it, it refers to the people that use this, right? Because the people that use are also part of the system. They need to understand how they're using it. They need to understand how that data is used. But let's take the example that uh, that you have. If I have a coffee shop, you want to start your um, your program here. Uh, you start uh, by taking a representation of that person's image. So you're going to do a capturing approach. That capturing approach, it's for you to decide, but it has to be as user friendly as possible because you want that approach to be um, as real life as you can. Because then people walking up to um, to be served, uh, they won't just sit in a booth, take a uh, expression. They will just be walking in natural, and you want to match that as close as possible. What you're going to do then is based on. Actually, I can go here. Once you've done your capturing, uh, your capturing can be with or without accessories. You can capture once, or you can capture multiple times throughout the lifetime. Um, of that identity. So we will also use this term. We have face template and we have identity, and we're going to match those at a certain point. Uh, and why I'm saying with or without accessories, perhaps at some point that person is going to come in with a scarf uh, or even with the mask that we need to wear now. How do you identify that person? Do you have enough data points in your template? Then you extract, uh, you pass that. Um, you pass that image through the algorithm that we've discussed earlier. You create a template uh, of that uh, face, face, so that mathematical representation of that face of that person. Um, and you do something which is called enrollment, um, which means you match that template. You create that template, you match that template with the identity. And then later on, you can update this um, uh, template if you have new data, and we'll see in a second why do I say that. Now, if I want to um, say I'm I'm approaching the I, I've joined the the program, the coffee shop loyalty program. I'm approaching to place my order. If I how how do I ensure that? Well, let, let me say, let me phrase who I is. I am being. I'm the the person serving you. You're approaching me, right? I'm my software. My camera has detected that um, you might be uh, yes, sir. And um, how is it? How does it know that? Right? You only have one image of you when you join the program. Now I have an image of you when you're coming up to me. So what it's going to do is that face template. Uh, obviously, it's going to pass this image to that algorithm again. It's going to detect the area. Uh, where your face is, it's going to uh, take create that temporary template of you. And what's going to do is going to match that temporary template. It's going to do something called a distance or a um, uh, what was it? it's a uh, uh, um, a loss for I forgot the whole term, uh, but it's in it's in the in notes that I've pasted there. What it's going to do is 
it there it's going to determine if that temporary template is close or far away from the template that I have of you when you join the program. And I think you've done in mathematics, you at least you've done Euclidean distance. You know how to uh, calculate the distance between two points in, in space. Uh, it's a very similar approach to that. Yeah. Uh, we we talked about it. This is I think you're talking about the threshold, right? So ah, the threshold. We'll get to that yeah, in a second. To, to what <laughs> extent? Like to what extent it is acceptable for a face? Uh, so I think that also goes into the area of like false positives and false negatives. Uh, mm -hmm. I think with the mask example, you just gave a great example. So how can you adapt such a system so that it will still be able to recognize a face? without giving any uh, like uh, false positives or negatives. Uh, I think this, maybe we can talk about this as well. Um, so I think it's a good time to, to pause at that here because in terms of comparison, right? As I said, I have the temporary template, which is the one that has been generated when you approached me at the till. Uh, I have your initial template when you joined the program, but you've had changes since then. So. Yeah. If I'm comparing the two images, um, if I'm comparing your first image with your first image, I'm going to have it really close, uh, almost overlapping to each other. Mm -hmm. Now, then as your features change over time, you're going to have a greater and greater distance, yeah. right? So what I can do, and coming to, to the threshold part, I can either set that a 70% is acceptable or 65% or... 99% it's acceptable uh, and I don't do anything other than that. Mm -hmm. Or I keep uh, using a human approach to continuously update your template. So if you're approaching me, my system tells me, I might have a system here that says, hey, this is 60% likely that it's yes sir. Um, and then you might the, the, the system is going to tell me you might want to check. So you're approaching me. I'm saying, hey, uh, by any chance are you or you might engage into a human uh, control approach to determine if that person is uh, who was detected. And then what you can do is you can notify the system. So as we were talking about earlier, if we want to update the model, we label our new data. So. After in, during my interaction, I can say that this person is or is yes sir, and what you can do with that is if that person is yes sir, it would take that new image, it would pass it through the whole extraction, and then it would add it to the existing templates. And with that, what I can do there is I can create um, a system that also allows to detect from different poses. Or because a pose again, a, if I take a pose from a pose like this, right? I only see half the face. It's similar uh, in data points as if just having a mask over my face and not being able to detect uh, the whole features. So what mm -hmm. I can do, what I can do there is, I can improve the accuracy by giving this system more examples of what that person looks like in under different conditions. And it's going to create a model, a more complex model, just like with the classifiers. It's going to create a more complex mathematical representation of that same person. But isn't this a compromise between, uh, like, isn't this a compromise of security? Because you have less data points, and from those less data points, you're trying to reach to the template. So I, don't you think that this will... Uh, uh, result in uh, less accuracy. That means there will be a lot of uh, false positives. So that that that's a good that's a good question. Uh, and let me actually jump on to a diagram about this, right? Because I, I think this is what you're uh, referring to. So what do I understand by false positive and true positives? Um, or what do I understand by false negative and true negative? at least in the concept of uh, facial recognition. So um, I'm going to here, I'm going to introduce a new term, which is called a probe. A probe is this temporary template that I've been discussing about. 
And um, the probe image is going to be the image I'm going to use to test against the image I have enrolled. Or the probe template to test it against the template that I have enrolled. OK, so a true positive uh, means that the um, test um, matches correctly what I have already on file. Mm -hmm. and, and then in terms of accuracy here, um, it can be uh, with high accuracy, but that's up to you to determine what high accuracy means. And I'll come back to, to that in a second. But for the purpose here, let's assume a 90 percent. Right, and I'm saying 90% because there might be a slight color change in the image. A true negative uh, means that the image, uh, the test image, uh, does not match. Um, uh, does not match anything I have on file. Uh, you're a new person. You're someone that hasn't uh, been enrolled into the system. Your template doesn't uh, exist. So your probe um, is determined that it's not uh, a template we know of, and so I'm not going to match you. A false positive means that I'm taking my, I'm taking your probe, uh, your your temporary template. Um, that template is not enrolled into the system, right? You don't exist, but it's finding that you might match thirty or forty percent with someone. So do you consider that as a high accuracy or do you consider that as a low accuracy? That again is a decision that you, you have to make responsibly and we'll come to that. Uh, a false negative uh, it means that uh, I'm taking your probe, your, uh, your template, I've, uh, that template exists in the system, but you're coming back with zero similarity. Right, it can happen. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and it can happen in exactly this context. It could be because of the mask on your face. It could be because I don't have enough uh, data of you. One of the tricks in image processing, or one of one of the difficulties in image processing, is when you prepare your models, you need to give it as diverse data as possible. That can mean grayscale images. That can mean inverse color images. Mm -hmm. um, that can mean images with uh, obstruction. They can mean images with um, high or low saturation, right? You can detect me now because you're trained to detect me. But if I get closer and uh, the, so if I change the how the sun uh, comes on my face, um, I'm going to be full blown white and it's going to be hard for a system to, to detect me. But that you need to take into account. And that you need to take into account in creating your accuracy threshold. And for every accuracy threshold, you also need to ensure that you have a way to confirm that, especially when the accuracy isn't as good as you want. Um, you need uh, to make sure. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Can I ask you a quick question here again? Sorry for mm -hmm. interfering. Just go ahead. Put over there, but. Here, I think we are talking from a perspective of a programmer. So we can just use an API and just play with the accuracy and accuracy threshold, just bring it up and down, play with the levels. Uh, how about uh, a system, let's say on my phone, mm -hmm. does this accuracy threshold remains the same as I just first started using it, or it keeps going up and down through the time I use it? Okay, that that's a, that's a good question. Uh, who would like, be? Is like this accuracy level? Like, is it always seventy one percent, or it just goes up and down? And if it goes up and down, if it's adaptable, uh, mm -hmm. based on what? And if it's adaptable uh, through the entire system, or it depends on the person. For example, I think there are different approaches. Like, if I'm talking about my phone, it's meant to recognize me and not somebody else. But if you're talking about the system in uh, camera shop, like uh, sorry, a talk shop, mm -hmm. uh, coffee shop, then we are talking about many people's face templates and uh, accuracy level. Will it be the same for everyone or it will have different accuracy thresholds for every face template that has got? I'm not so sure I, 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 I think I understand. So uh, how how 
how does the accuracy look like if I'm comparing myself against uh, different images of myself? And how does the accuracy look like if I'm comparing myself against a system that has many other faces? That's what I think you're asking. Yeah. So um, obviously for, for the different scenarios, uh, that threshold is defined through um, a data sense approach. So here, it, it, um, you you need to see if your data is skewed towards more um, uh, towards a certain application, towards a certain group, towards certain features of, of your face. And obviously, for for those uh, different scenarios, you would want to set a different threshold. That threshold should be the same for the system because in the end, you would. Um, you would want your system to be validated, not individual uh, comparisons. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to, to refer to would be a, a system uh, threshold. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to refer to uh, a threshold from between person and person, right? Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to, to set that because what I can do, um, and it comes from a data science perspective and not from a programming perspective, I can take those results that uh, from from my data set, and I can see um, graphically how well that system is doing for errors. And I'm going to find mm -hmm. the 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 value that has the base trade best trade off between uh, low errors uh, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, good um, true values. I see. OK, because uh, so once I've done that, um, and this, this again falls within the area of responsible AI, um, perhaps, uh, and here I'm, I'll talk plainly uh, because there's no, no, no reason to hide behind it, but the, um, the, the color of your skin can have difficulty. And obviously, you don't want a system for which you need to set a different threshold depending on the different color uh, of the skin. Be because would that fall in a discriminative uh, system? Or would that fall in, uh, in a system that's not actually tackling the challenge of facial recognition? Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's uh, that's something uh, behind the ethical aspects, and that's something that's actually been been studied. Um, but after have all of these details, um, after you've come to to the till, I've identified that you are the person you're saying. I'm improving my system with each interaction. I'm confirming that you're the person. I might update your database with your uh, most recent representation. Um, it's up to to you to implement that um, secure approach, right? Because you were talking also about security based on that threshold. You won't ever in real life use one system um, for 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 recognition. You will always imply multiple systems to to make sure that's the case. And I think you've seen that perhaps in movies. There's uh, facial recognition, there's voice recognition, there's fingerprint recognition, and then they go through the door. Mm -hmm. So your system, your coffee shop system, might want to use something similar to that if you if you want to for it to be as secure as possible uh, from a person's perspective. Obviously, the main aspect that you need to look at in terms of security is to secure your data so you don't um, lose um the people's trust and I'll, I'll get to to that in a second any questions so far i know we're almost out of time my last two slides are going to be on a sample architecture but and the last one is going to be on um reg, uh, regulations and compliance if you have questions you can ask guys if not maybe it's time for us to proceed with like with those uh, ethical considerations like regulations, et cetera, and I think we can, with that, we can go ahead. Okay, uh, sorry, I clicked here. So I wanted to talk about this, di this diagram, but we don't have uh, that much time. I'll come back to this in a second. Um, 
This is not, this is the closest diagram I have to what a system like that could look like. It's not necessarily talking about technologies that exist only within Microsoft. This is a diagram you can use uh, even if you want to create it on your local machine. But I'll talk about that later on. I need to go through these. Um, so really quick, um, some of the most important aspects in being ethical and then on, on being secure. Um, I've put the whole link in, in the bottom of the page, but um, there are six principles in making your AI um, serve the world and not to serve against it. Um, so what I mean by fairness and that uh, it should treat all people fairly, it's exactly um, the discussion we've had earlier about accuracy. Should I have different accuracy threshold for white people? Should I have different accuracy threshold for uh, black people? Should I have different accuracy threshold for um, different color skins, right? For, for, for brown, for, um, and it, couldn't, it, couldn't, it doesn't have to be people, right? It could be game characters. You have your green skin orcs, you have your um, pale sk uh, skin um, night elves, and so on. So do I set different thresholds for that? In, in, you don't want to enforce stereotypes, right? But in, in the end, wouldn't you rather prefer a mm -hmm. more accurate system if you're going to be using different threshold for different, uh, different races? Because in the end, people's perception, like your clients and consumers of this system, would want the system to, to identify themselves as they are. But if a black person is finding the system is unable to accurately identify him because he is black, and, and that goes down to the coding because the threshold for that black person is set the same as a white person, and wouldn't you rather go and change it uh, just to remove that uh, problem? Or your that, definite fairness in this case is use the same threshold and that's how we uh, call it fairness. So th that is, those are the two different school of thoughts that I could identify in this. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is actually, um, there was an example, do I have? that it was an example um, that in the US, and this is one of the reasons why facial recognition is a major issue in the US, in the, in the US there was a mathematical study that was conducted. Um, black women uh, mm -hmm. were most likely identified uh, or matched with individuals in the FBI database that were recognized as um, criminals. Right, so there was always this uh, big warning sign associated with facial recognition. Beware that you're not uh, actually mislabeled or mismatched. Um, and the, 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 that's where the school of thoughts uh, come into play. Um, do I do that? Is that ethical? I'm not the person to answer those questions at the moment. Um, what it can be, it, it could be a challenge either for the people for a challenge to represent this in a in a fair way and then in a in a way that shows that the system works for for people that are using the system or, or for people that want to prove that indeed there is a necessity to have this distinguish uh, between uh, the different skin tones the different um, the different features but don't assume from the beginning that you need to do that because it relies into um, the transparency factor of what it means to be responsible. Mm -hmm. you, you need to say why your system has made those decisions. And, and another example uh, that comes under fairness doesn't relate to, to the coffee shop here, but it actually could relate to the coffee shop. Um, would you find that from preference, um, white people are more interested in uh, pumpkin spice latte, or uh, you would find um, um, black people more interested in um, highly sugared drinks, right? Is that a system that's transparent? Is that something that you've defined into your system, or is that coming from uh, 
the exchanges between you and the, the customer? Um, are you using that in a fair way? Or, um, why am I saying you're using that in a fair way? Are you going to label that same preference against okay. all your other black customers or all against your white customers? I see right. your point. So when you have different thresholds, you're actually allowing your uh, AI to have a different classification for those uh, people. Yes. And that's could, that could be mistreated. But, but I think there are things that can be done here, like maybe your AI knows about that, but it doesn't allow it to be part of its API so that the consumers of your like uh, facial recognition system do not have access to it, so they can't use it for marketing purposes. Like, oh, I have, I have witnessed, I have a lot more black people, so they are more interested in this product, so let me just give them and advertise those products. Maybe you don't give access to them, but it remains hidden inside the code. That would be one, I don't know, one approach that I'm thinking now. Well, it, it could be an approach. But again, um, th there are pros and cons to that. Why would I, if it's my, if it's data that you've consent that I use to approach you with no more preferences, why mm -hmm. should I withhold um, reviewing that data and create targeted ads for you? Right. That's also one of the major problems that people are seeing right now with with uh, with the internet. Is it a problem or is it yeah. a way for you to trick the system? <laughs> there will always be workarounds. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you can uh, the workaround can be also from you as the person that is at the receiving end of that system. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, that's it. That's a good thing, Eric. Actually, all these titles here are. We don't have a definitive answer to all these questions. Yep. So there are many rights and wrongs in, in this area, and people have different perspectives. Yeah, that, that's yeah. that's that's what. Yeah. Um, cool. I'm not sure if I should go through the others. I think that the, the most important one uh, from this is um, privacy and security, because mm -hmm. once you have someone's data, you're responsible for that data. Your data uh, data. Uh, store and data processor, um, and it also falls into one of the regulations, which is for GDPR. GDPR. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here, I I can actually elaborate on this a little bit. GDPR applies on uh, European Union countries, right, or the companies who are operating in the in those areas. But you are a worldwide company, so when you say we are compliant to some regulations. So your compliance changes from one country to another, I believe, right? And how do you would the, deal with this complexity of compliances? Yes and or no. <laughs> <laughs> so the first way to deal with these compliance issues is to make sure that uh, the data for a region is stored in that region. So that's why you have data centers in different uh, parts mm -hmm. of the world. Um, as, as long as you know a data center is physically located in a country, you know it is required to respect that country's uh, legal compliance. And here I'm talking, I can talk about internal regulations, not just about GDPR. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also the issue where um, what if I am a European customer using the system in Europe? Yes, if I'm using the system in Europe, it means that the, the system should be stored in Europe. It shouldn't change data with different regions. So a person um, that is, say, in the U.S. Um, and located in the U.S., they will be only using uh, the system that's located for the U.S. But what if I am changing somehow uh, from one part to another? Well, if I'm traveling mm -hmm. and I need, I need to do this, I need to find a way either for that European person to be able to be uh, to, to re-enroll in the US, or I need to find, I have to uh, figure a way in my US region to have a separate database that follows GDPR compliance, but stored in the US. So as, as a company outside of the European Union, if I'm doing business with the European Union, Mm -hmm. still need to follow European Union reg uh, regulations. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. If I have my email address, if I'm working for a company in the US and my email address is in the US, because I am both a European Union citizen and physically located in the European Union, they are required to store my email address on a server that has EU regulation uh, applied to it. Okay, but here there comes a lot of problems, right? So if you have a GDPR compliant data server for your European uh, clients, who let's say live in US and uh, doesn't this also uh, uh, conflict with US regulations? Aren't there any overlaps between GDPR and US regulations? Because data server is physically in US, but you simply just make it GDPR compliant. And how do you deal with those uh, overlaps? I knew the answer to that because I actually had a scenario like that a while ago. Um, yeah. I, but I think in, in that case, um, the business that can offer a GDPR compliance system, mm -hmm. um, they are actually passing through certain checks to ensure that that is allowed from both uh, um, from both legislations, right? Um, one of the main aspects of GDPR is to ensure that your data is not going to be used in certain purposes. Mm -hmm. So uh, as long as there is no legal requirement uh, that selling you need to sell this person's data, then there isn't going to be an overlap, right? There's no, there isn't going to be a conflict between those. Um, but I do have certain uh, legislation items that require. So in that scenario, data can or could be made available uh, from a GDPR server, if you have a, a legal requirement to access that, do you have a warrant? Do you have um, other um, regulatory items that allow exchange between the two um, type of uh, legislations? I see, but the clients are made aware of this, otherwise there will be problems, yes. right? Yes. Okay. One of the most important aspects of the GDPR, and this is one of the most important aspects of your privacy, is can at any moment of time your customers access their data? Mm -hmm. Do they know how your system is using that data? And um, can they, I don't know, opt out of that at any given moment, right? You, you are required to set this. You, uh, uh, if you're talking about person uh, that needs to comply to GDPR regulations. There are companies outside of this uh, legislation area that might make it difficult for you to get out of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, that's, one, that's one way to, to trick people to stay in your system. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for the sake of time, uh, just really quick go through the others. Um, transparency means, uh, as I said, making sure that you help people that the date where the data centers are located, you tell people that uh, this data is going to be used only to um, improve their preferences, not to create a matching um, template for or ma matching not template. Let me use the correct word here: uh, a, 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 a bias matrix um, that applies to others. Um, I am going to allow people to. Uh, opt in or opt out at any time. There are some industry standards, and I think this is what you're also referring to. I still have some global standards that I need to apply. Now, GDPR builds on global standards. It doesn't come against global standards. Um, and equally important, um, so I'm going to take the example of Germany. Um, Germany has, um, has bef even before GDPR, had stringent requirements for identities. And GDPR only builds on top of that. So GDPR isn't going to uh, conflict with German legislation, but I also need to make sure that I'm respecting both if I'm creating a data store in Germany. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was that was the, the, the part that I wanted to approach. Um, do I still have time to quickly talk about what this is? So how much um, how much 
much have you had the chance to to learn about computers? How much have you had the chance to learn about the internet? Um, I'm going to use here some key terms, and these are actually the key terms that I want you to to take away from this presentation. I've only used icons of what we have in in our uh, presentation uh, tools, but to rip, to depict the technology itself, but not to depict what to use. So one of the most important scenarios that you always want to have in this is you need to have a way to continuously develop your model. Uh, that means you need to have a way to store, to have a version control. So you've probably used, have heard of GitHub, have heard of other scenarios. If you haven't, this is widely used in development because it has something called version control. It can allow me to quickly go to previous version. It can quickly allow me to uh, collaborate at scale. I want to be able to run this locally uh, on my machine, and I want to be able to store this in the cloud so that it's picked up uh, at any time for scale. Now, for scale, if I want to serve this at scale, what I mean by serving at scale is I can either have multiple servers, uh, which is basic physical machines, right? I can have multiple laptops, multiple desktop machines that all serve the same purpose, or I can have something that's been used in the recent years, about 10 or 15 years now, something called, um, you might have heard of it as Docker. You might have heard of it as Kubernetes. Um, this is a way, um, what, what it is, it, it creates on the same laptop or on the same desktop or on the same machine, it creates multiple independent instances um, of itself and then allows you to run the code. Um, this is actually used uh, to scale down on having to use 10 virtual machines that are different 10 websites. I can have one machine that has 10 separate instances of itself, each independent in each of them means a website. That's also used in web hosting. Yeah. Uh, but I want to have that uh, so that it's accessed um, from, from the cloud really quick. If I need to create even 10 more instances really quick, I can do that within five minutes. Um, I want to make sure that I'm not overloading my system. I want to balance between um, these services. So what I'm going to have is uh, a way to send uh, to access these, um, I'm going to use the term load to load balance, and a load balancer is a server that knows to to direct a re, uh, a request to access a resource based on um, certain mathematical principles. And what I want most importantly to ensure my data is safe and my users are safe, I need an identity provider. That can be Facebook, can be Gmail, can be Microsoft, can be um, Outlook, can be anything. But I would use a system that adheres to certain standards so I can share that trust with my consumers. And then I have my web apps. Um, I think a web app is something that uh, or our website, it's something that you may have studied in um, in, in school already. Um, this is actually a principle that's used uh, by Google. It's used by us. It's used by uh, Apple, although some of their models are running locally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was ah here, here this this is the last one and then I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll ask, let you answer a question. I just wanted to represent this in terms of fairness. Um, it was said that when they started uh, using test dummies in car crashes, mm -hmm. because that that uh, that test dummy was built uh, depicting a man. Uh, it didn't solve the injury uh, the the issues of injuries for women. So. Yeah. They had to create a model that was representing a woman to understand um, how uh, it, a car crash affects a woman. But that wasn't implicit. And that was a, a, a thing that was at that time, whereas if we depict 
uh, just one type, it's enough. But actually, you determine that you, you need to depict for uh, the individual types that exist. Yeah, the same for children, I believe. Uh, yep. Here is a question from me, like when you create such a system and just release an API, just uh, make it available for your clients to use in their own systems, are there any standards that you have to go through and get uh, approval of? Uh, example given, you know, in the uh, US, there is this uh, organization called FDA. So on any medical application or mm -hmm. uh, any medicine, uh, needs to prove, uh, show many evidences that it's been tested on lab rats and people, and we have those positive results. Please give us the permission to put it in the market. So, when you develop such a system, like, do you have to show evidence to some governing governing bodies, governments, or maybe some other organizations that your system is uh, transparent, is fair, and is ready be to used? Uh, not for all AI systems because there isn't a force to regulate that at the moment in uh, all the countries. Yeah. Um, so what 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 we use and what most of the uh, competitor or uh, companies use, um, it isn't uh, just a legislation system. And by here by legislation, um, it's mostly about making sure that data isn't used uh, to, to do harm. Um, the, the way to, to match that this is a better system as opposed to another one is actually based on academical studies um, that are, uh, are chosen agreed upon by the different companies uh, that are developing that. So you don't have a government organization that's saying this is the standard. You're having the different or uh, the different commercial organizations that have grouped together and approved that this is the academic standard that they should follow. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, I can tell you for translation services, right? That's also um, an approach. And there is mm -hmm. something called a blue score. That mm -hmm. is a math. That is an academic term and at academically developed uh, method. Um, that ensures uh, your translation is as good as possible. Mm -hmm. Right, for facial recognition, actually, I think I had one. Let me see here. It was, it was a metric, an academic metric that was used to match um, computer-generated um, response uh, to the human response and there, there was a name for that metric i need to find it um i'll find it and i'll send it <laughs> mm -hmm. and does that answer the question for now uh yes it does but you, you see that the title says responsible so the description of responsible here, if the governments are not asking, OK, you need to meet these standards and there are no standards that. Uh, but with, internally, you have a team that sets those standards. OK, our system should do this and that and sometimes go into the ethical uh, area. So uh, how do you know that this team who makes such decisions are acting responsibly? So, so the, the, I understand the what are the how, internal how, mechanisms that don't <laughs> let them cross the border over? Or they can whenever they want. So uh, th that, that's, a, that's a difficult conversation. And it's also one of the reasons why um, Microsoft has joined with different companies to make sure that it's not a standard set within one organization, mm -hmm. but that it's a standard that's set between multiple organizations. And it, it is an agreement made between the different um, developers of these technologies mm -hmm. that, they that they will adhere to these standards. If they're, they're not, then there are certain consequences to that. Um, and one of the ways, one of the ways this is achieved, I, there are legal teams Working with um, working with social social and psychological uh, departments mm -hmm. to to ensure that 
um, the way we develop and that the way that different organizations develop their technologies uh, matches um, serving ju just to serve the, the the basic principle of it. So we won't create a system that would de determine distinguish criminals. We will create a system that is able to distinguish between people. We will not label that more than uh, its simplest form. Everything else is something that you do and you apply. And we have never crossed a threshold where we are doing a system that is beyond uh, the basic cognitive action. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, what we also employ is um, the actual people that are affected uh, by um, going uh, against these standards. And we 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 use those um, the the knowledge of and experience and the studies of those those people to ensure that uh, any technology that comes uh, from cognitive space matches um, the standard that we've set. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, guys. Do you have any questions? I have a question of curiosity. It's related yeah. more in the future and not now. Okay. Uh, so it is always the best type. It, so AI now, if it were to improve way more in the future, how would this affect facial recognition and all other software? Uh, so, like, uh, would facial recognition be its own? Would it have its own? I think they have their own mind at the moment, but would they require more human interaction? Or would they require less? What scenario you're talking? Would you have in mind to more start in, off that you see now? Specifically in... with facial recognition, for example, when you said when you said earlier about requiring human interaction to identify if a person is that person, when the software says it's forty percent likely, I think that's what you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah in that regard would it require that human interaction if ai were to improve with it mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> one thing to one thing to understand is at the moment um ai is an extension of the human person it's not its uh, own um standing identity or it's not its own standing entity so AI is currently used more as a tool to uh, enhance skills or cognitive skills that you have as a person, right? Uh, it will allow you to quicker de de uh, determine um, if that person is perhaps in the coffee shop, allow you to, to uh, perhaps you don't know how to, to speak a certain language, but it'll allow you to have that exchange in that language through this tool. So Right now, yes, you need to have that human interaction, human validation, I would say, because with, with that human validation, you are applying to AI what has been applied to you in school, uh, a, a way to learn, a way to improve on your knowledge, and a way to be rewarded for every time you're correct and be punished for every time you're not. And I'm saying punished here in quotes because mm -hmm. it, it's not actually someone <laughs> punishing you. Um, but it is the system, it's this feedback loop that needs to needs to be present uh, until this uh, the system becomes more and more complicated. An AI system that's able to do this without um, human interaction, there are some attempts to do that. Um, the problem there is that the space in which I'm talking here about the mathematical and the the, the computational uh, requirements to to do that they are they're not possible for generalist approach. They still require you to to target the scenario, right? So perhaps in the future we might have a way that um, we will do this without. We're, we're gonna employ systems uh, to, to, to test in different ways. Uh, perhaps in the future we're gonna we're gonna do one we're gonna do something different. We won't ask the, the teller 
if uh, that person is who uh, we think it is, or who the algorithm thinks it is, perhaps in the future that AI is going to suggest um, a different test. A di different test is going to perhaps uh, talk to to the person, and it's going to ask them to say something, and then it would match them vocally, right? So it's going, as I said earlier, it's going to employ more and more layers to classify accurately if that person is who it is. But that you need to define, right? If my, if my accuracy is low and I don't want human interaction, can I trigger this different approach? Trigger conversation, trigger um, some kind of validation of preferences, date of birth or something, trigger something else. Once you get that second layer confirmation, trigger an update to the model, trigger uh, something that goes to to improve and to learn, to make the the system learn. You still need to have this kind of reward approach. Oh, okay. Thank you very much again, yeah. Kelly. Do you have any question? Um, actually, no. Okay. Um, I think I don't have any question too. <laughs> I, I know we're over time. I really appreciate everyone taking uh, the time to to be here. No, we thank you for being here and for giving us this uh, time. And uh, I think it's been just a good review of what we have done and some parts. Uh, we learned how companies approach to this AI and how uh, there are some standards and sometimes there are different compliance you have to go through. Uh, it was a lot to take in, uh, but it hopefully I are, able to, I are able to remember some of the things we already uh, done in class and then extend uh, uh, beyond that. Uh, thank you very much again, Razvan, for joining us here today and sharing your ideas on this uh, journey with my students again. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity thank and you, thank, thank you for uh, bearing through, as uh, Astrega here said, it, it is a lot to take in. Uh, I try to make it as um, layman terms as possible uh, because I wanted you to, to understand the principles behind it. I don't want to give you the technical uh, babble there uh, and just throw terms at you. It's just towards the end where I was talking about the architecture that I wanted to, to tell you because that always has been, even in school and in university, I've always seen in books how you can do a certain thing. I've never seen it in practical how it happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why I put that in there. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can you send me over the link after this, please? If yeah, yeah, I'll share both the, the video and the, the presentation, and then I'll add more data to there if, uh, if there's anything. Thank you very much. Good uh, luck, everyone. Good luck with your you. other assessments. Thank you. <laughs> yes, they are very busy with that. I think they're overwhelmed and maybe dying to go get back to their IAs if they're not finished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't keep you anymore. Thank you, everyone. Take care and uh, keep healthy. Yeah. That's the most important. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.